Just two hours ago, Allied Air Forces began an attack on military targets in Iraq and Kuwait. Fossil fuels, a fundamental building block to modern humanity. A resource so important that it can drastically alter a country's fate if it happens to be located on top of a fossil fuel reservoir. With huge economies intricately linked to the extraction and export of fossil fuels, it grants these nations, or petrostates, the ability to accumulate vast wealth from fossil fuel exports, political power to control exports, and the wealth to bribe or suppress dissent at home or abroad. So, for the last 200 years, this resource has influenced or been a part of the global geopolitical order. Nations are rising against nations in an attempt to exert control over fossil fuels, with decades-long repercussions. As the world unites for a greener future to avert the detrimental effects of climate change, will we realize a greener, utopian future with fewer conflicts? If so, what will happen to oil and gas nations? Does building a future based on renewable energy not require any unique resources? And why is renewable energy suddenly taking center stage now? The rise of renewable energy, which is displacing fossil fuels, is analogous to oil replacing coal or coal replacing wood. It's largely due to a sharp drop in costs, along with the immense value or convenience it brings to humanity at large. Simply put, it is cheaper and more efficient. Take the case of solar energy generation as an example. This is Sarah Kurtz, an engineering professor at the University of California, Merced. The cost per square meter of a panel is about the same as if you hired somebody to come in and paint your house. So it's really amazing how much the costs have come down, the efficiencies have gone up, the rate of change of the evolution of the technology is actually accelerating. This is the levelized cost of renewable energy charted from 2010 to 2019. Solar energy costs have reduced by almost 80%, whereas those of wind or hydro energy sources pale in comparison. As a result of technological innovation and scientific advancement, solar and wind power have increased in capacity and now make up a larger and larger portion of the global energy mix. But as energy generation becomes increasingly reliant on more renewable sources, what about countries that do not have much sun or wind? What happens to oil nations? As renewable energy sources continue to increase their share in electricity generation, it will inevitably reshape global geopolitics. This has to do with the nature of renewable energy itself. Unlike fossil fuels, which are concentrated in a few regions of the world. Venezuela, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Iraq, Kuwait, and the United Arab Emirates and Russia. Renewable energy sources are accessible in most countries in one form or another. This significantly reduces present energy choke points, which are critical for the global oil supply and small passageways on busy maritime routes. Nations with access to sunshine or wind are now granted the capability for decentralized energy production and consumption, which allows them to be deployed at almost any scale. Unlike fossil fuels, which can be measured in barrels, renewable energy sources come in the form of flows that can't be stopped and can't be used up. This tremendously reduces the risk of a country being overly dependent on a centralized fossil fuel source and helps achieve energy self-sufficiency. And this importance was clearly demonstrated in Russia's invasion of Ukraine. President Volodymyr Zelensky says Russian attacks have destroyed nearly a third of Ukraine's power stations, causing blackouts across the country. As more nations enter this new space age of renewable energy, 
the political and economic dominance of nations that rely on fossil fuels will dwindle as renewable energy sources become more widely available. Countries that depend too much on oil exports as a share of their gross domestic product, GDP, will find this change to be especially hard. This can lead to internal instability with potentially disastrous consequences for entire areas. Already Sudan, Nigeria and Chad may face shock decarbonization as earnings from oil, their major export commodity, collapse, leaving governments unable to preserve fragile political arrangements. As humanity pursues this greener and more stable geopolitical future, we will eventually wean ourselves off of our dependence on fossil fuels. The future world order will be more democratic than the current one, in which only a few groups, like OPEC, have a lot of power. But this created another scramble for a different type of raw material. Rare minerals are becoming the focal point of energy geopolitics as the world shifts toward renewable energy. Well, over in China, extreme weather and a slowing economy have highlighted challenges in the country's ambitious plan to use more renewable energy by 2025. China dominates some 80 percent of the global lithium market. Supply chains for rare minerals that are needed to make green technology will change the geopolitical landscape, and countries are working hard to make sure they have a steady supply of minerals for this green transition. Demand for transition-critical minerals, like copper, cobalt, lithium, and so-called rare earth elements, is expected to accelerate as more industrialized countries develop electric cars, solar panels, wind turbines, and battery systems to store and distribute renewable energy. Any country that can control the supply of these rare minerals in a post-carbon world will wield a lot of political power. In a strange twist, these minerals are not actually rare and can be found in many places around the world. The problem is that most countries don't have the technology to process them or can't mine them profitably because of strict environmental and social rules. Mining for lithium, copper, and rare earths all consume a significant amount of fuel and water, resulting in significant environmental costs. At the moment, most of the important parts for green technologies come from a smaller number of countries, like China, Myanmar, and the DR Congo, that are willing to pay the environmental and social costs. If they can turn the fact that they have a lot of transition-critical minerals into political power, they could become the OPEC of the post-carbon era. The next big question is who can process the minerals? As adapting to and reducing the effects of climate change becomes a global political priority, control over adaptive technologies becomes a new geopolitical currency. Countries that can provide clean energy or renewable technologies have an edge over their rivals. And it seems that one country is becoming the main supplier of solar panels, batteries, and critical minerals. China. More than 70% of the world's solar photovoltaic panels, 50% of its electric cars, and a third of its wind energy are produced in China. Additionally, it is the world's largest battery manufacturer and in charge of a number of raw materials essential to clean tech supply chains, including cobalt, rare earth minerals, and polysilicon, a component of solar panels. This was the result of Beijing's early embrace of renewable energy manufacturing, with a particular emphasis on solar panels and LEDs in 2007. So how do they do this? Beijing adopts an effective strategy to dominate global solar panel markets by leveraging its manufacturing prowess. The government first provides massive subsidies to their domestic companies triggering them to overproduce and create excessive quantities. This creates strong downward pricing pressure and eventually makes every solar panel manufacturer in the market uncompetitive. Now, 
Beijing is using the same formula for another important component of a green future, batteries. This, in combination with solar and wind energy, will complete the equation to solve climate change and disrupt petroleum consumption. It does this by addressing the primary bottleneck of renewable energy generation, intermittency. It reduces peak power use when the sun sets or during power outages by storing extra energy from an abundance of light or wind. China's current dominance over battery manufacturing is identical to the strategy in the solar panel market. Since 2015, Beijing has put a lot of money into making batteries and electric cars, and it has helped its own companies by giving them a lot of money. Its poster child, Contemporary Amperex Technology, or CATL for short, is now the largest producer of batteries, with contracts with some of the world's largest automakers, including Tesla and Daimler. The scale of this manufacturing capability brought about by Beijing's industrial policy has reduced the cost of lithium-ion batteries by almost 86% compared to a decade ago. And it's not just batteries alone. Beijing controls the whole supply chain, from mineral mines in the Democratic Republic of the Congo through the final fabrication of lithium-ion batteries. Its firms hold more than 85% of the world's refined cobalt chemical capacity, which is required for the majority of lithium-ion batteries. It also mines nearly all of the rare earth minerals needed in electric motors and wind turbines. It is nearly impossible to create an electric car without incorporating China. China's dominance in clean energy has met strong pushback, and Beijing has been showing its willingness to use it for geopolitical influence. Its changes on its own to how it exports important minerals have already caused countries like the US, Japan, India, and Australia to go around China to get rare minerals. Many global leaders are also showing increasing levels of concern over China's dominance, as it is not strategic to have over-reliance on China's supply chains for the energy transition. However, it seems inevitable that as nations invest more in green energy, some of the money will flow back to China. With massive capital investments required for net zero commitments, countries are anxious about when that economic benefit will be reaped disproportionately by China. There are two camps of opinion about the energy transition. One believes it is a kind of clean energy realpolitik, marked by the desire to gain economic advantage. This sort of thinking is reflected in the actions of China, the US, and Europe. But the other is that clean energy will involve a lot less geopolitics and might help reduce conflict, a more utopian future. Control levers will still exist in the clean energy system, but they will never be as powerful as they were in the fossil fuel environment. Even though China is far ahead in many areas, this should not be seen as a threat. This is due to the fact that renewable energy sources are not the same as fossil fuels. Once a country has effectively scaled its renewable energy infrastructure to self-sufficiency, it is no longer vulnerable to external geopolitical forces. Unlike in the past, when oil-producing countries dominated the geopolitical landscape. As the energy transition accelerates over the next several years, the most vocal opposition is expected to come from countries that generate fossil fuels. Even under the best-case scenario, it will take decades to phase out oil and gas from the energy system. Oil-producing countries will keep taking hydrocarbons out of the ground as long as they can stop the switch to renewable energy, even if it means driving down the prices of oil and gas. With the green transition going as fast as it can, it seems pointless to try to stop it, and things that were once thought to be impossible now seem completely possible. Clean energy is poised to reshape the globe in the same way that coal and oil did. Not only will the energy shift reduce emissions, it will also redistribute power and hopefully lead to a more peaceful future.